Coming up on this episode of The Social Hour, a documentary about Twitter called Twittermentary. Cool? Awesome? Navel-gazing? You be the judge. Plus, the New York Times is humanizing its Twitter feed. But why? A service about sharing cars socially. It won TechCrunch Disrupt. Will it win your heart? And is Urban Outfitters ripping off an independent artist necklace design? People on Twitter are upset about it. All that and non-Twitter stories coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Episode 10, recorded Friday, May 27th, 2011. This episode of the Social Hour is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com slash social hour. And be sure to check out their annual plans for savings of up to 20% off. And buy FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look professional. Get started with a free package at freshbooks.com. And buy Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Social Hour. We are at episode 10. That means we're in the double digits in Petaluma, California. I'm Sarah Lane. And in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, I am Amber MacArthur. Amber, we got to episode 10. I think we're on to something. Made it. I know, you know, it's been an exciting 10 shows and uh, always lots to talk about. And the thing that's excited me the most, I think, about this show is how much the audience is participating back to us, whether they're sending videos or emails or tweets. Just so nice to have that input because obviously there's no possible way that Sarah and I could cover the entire social world just on our own. Yes, absolutely. You're completely correct. We have a really good show today. In fact, um, we're going to start off. We have a guest uh, that we're going to get to in a second. We're going to start off with who has actually made a documentary about Twitter, uh, which yeah. is, you know, you think to yourself, Twitter, I mean, a documentary about Twitter. Gosh, isn't living Twitter enough? But apparently <laughs> not. And in fact, before we before we introduce our guest, I thought we'd play a little teaser video from the documentary so the folks at home can get a little bit of an idea of of what a t Twitter documentary would, would, would seem like. What do you think, Amber? Let's do it. All right. Everybody has haters. Yeah, once the government got it on Twitter, I don't want to be involved with it. Oh, good. Let him hate it. Let him hate it. Send those haters. Let him go get a hug. Be careful what you say on Twitter, baby. Okay. Trust me when I say that. Twitter's like my boyfriend. I'm telling you, I have a Twitter crush on Twitter. I know. It's creepy. I heard Twitter was a stupid place that people just talked about what they wanted to have for lunch. And I said, well, that's where I belong. Some people <laughs> Twitter, like, if they're having breakfast that day, you know, that's not really. Can Twitter do anything? Can Twitter wipe my ass? No. But people can. Such a great uh, little trailer there. Uh, the uh, last clip was especially interesting. So uh, we have our guest on the line right now on Skype who has woken up at 3 in the morning all the way from Singapore to join us and talk about uh, this documentary. Hi, Siok. Hi, Amber. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Siok. Uh, this, I love the idea of the Twittermentary. Tell us, uh, what, how did it come about? How did you decide to make a documentary about the life of Twitter? Well, I, I think because I was very... I come from, I'm a traditional TV producer, mm -hmm. and three or four years ago, I, I, I fell into the circle of uh, uh, Twitterers, uh, felt, kind of started using Facebook and then Twitter, and I became quite fascinated by it, because it seems that, uh, uh, it seems a great topic for a film, because uh, it's very, very difficult to encapsulate what Twitter means. 
I find that there are two camps, the people who are really into Twitter, and then there are people who don't get it, or they will sign up for an town and abandon it. And the two groups of people really have a hard time communicating. The people who are off Twitter have a very hard time conveying or expressing what is it that they love so much about about uh, Twitter. And this is also, I also feel that there's a level of abstraction about microblogging that is not the same as Facebook. Because on Facebook, um, what you see is what you get. If you post a photo, you see the photo on the timeline. But I think what everyone does with uh, 140 characters is something very personal, and everyone uses it in a different way, which actually makes mm -hmm. it quite difficult to to summarize, to, to capture. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so what, what can... This might be kind of an obvious question for you, but uh, what camp do you fall into as far as your experience with Twitter and, and when you started using it and how you incorporate it into your life? I think in terms of where I stand is, I was, I think I was very curious about Twitter because it's very different from anything I've experienced. And uh, I, I fell into it, I got to know a group of people and therefore I kind of uh, started exploring it. So, so my position shifted over time from one of Curiosity. I remember at the two weeks point when I was two weeks after I got on Twitter, I remember tweeting, Twitter is the weirdest application on the planet. Why would anyone want to use it? Because it, it takes a while to get a hang of it. But I think over time, I, I've grown to understand uh, it a lot, a lot better. If not, also because I, I had actually finished and marketed two films by now within the three and a half years on Twitter. So I, I experienced it on a level that most people wouldn't be able to, because uh, there are people on Twitter that have helped me promote my film, screen my film, uh, this, you know, and even now with this documentary, uh, a lot of the help and input comes from the people on Twitter. So I, I have a much deeper appreciation uh, for it now. So I've moved from being a skeptic to kind of being a fan so of you, Twitter. So how did you get... Um you know, from the teaser, we can see that there are a variety of people who have participated and given their views on Twitter. Um, and even when I was when I was looking at the list of folks uh, from your website that have participated, I even recognized a few names because they're my Twitter friends and or people I know socially on the internet. How did you how did you get the folks that you brought together to participate? I think what's really lovely about the project is that um, I, I started with a very simple idea, and looking back, it, it's almost naive. My idea was simply to make a film about Twitter uh, with, in collaboration with the people on Twitter. So there's an element of crowdsourcing. And uh, I, 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 I think it was just something of, to make a film about Twitter by the people on Twitter. And so, therefore, I started with a website where we called for submissions and we had 100 stories. And what's lovely about the process is really that um, instead of me having all the answers about how to make a film about Twitter, people actually came, people hear about the idea over time and then they come along and basically collaborated with me. And I'm talking about pretty much total strangers. So I went from, after I had the website, there was a, an artist in New York um, and he heard about the idea through social media and basically uh, invited me to speak at a conference about Twitter, the 140 characters conference. And he had a great idea, which is that, why don't we go across, take a road trip across America, stop in every other city and film people and ask, ask them for their story about Twitter. So we went from a website to a road trip and we used Twitter all along the way. So we were tweeting along the road trip, asking for suggestions, story leads, characters we can film, and uh, even when, when we were about to be stranded, we were asking for help. So there were actually people who came out of their way to, to bail us out. Um, so in a way, because of the whole process, the, it's not just a film about Twitter, but the, the, the process of making it, the backstory of how we make the film becomes a story that reveals how Twitter works and how you can solve problems with the help of other people on Twitter. So, so I think that's what makes the film special in the sense that um, as a filmmaker, I'm not trying to be uh, the, the, uh, the person who knows it all, you know, the kind of the genius filmmaker that, that had all the answers from the beginning. But rather, I invited people to collaborate with me. And at every stage 
a different person come along or, or a different group of persons come along. So now even as we are getting ready to uh, to distribute the film and screen the film, um, a lot of the ideas for marketing also comes from people who have seen the film, um, a work in progress and put up their hand and said, Siok, I, I really want to help you market this film. And they have wonderful ideas as well. So it's very open source, which means it kind of uh, neat in the sense of the in terms of characters, I think, as uh, Sarah mentioned, what's nice is really that there's an unexpected element. There are some expected stories on the list, but there are also stories that I never set up to, to cover because I didn't know they exist. But because of the crowdsourcing, people made me aware of, of these stories through Twitter. And what's, what's going to be the format for the film as far as people out there? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people who would love to watch it. When will it be available? Will it be online? Will it be free? How long will it be? Can you answer some of those questions for us? Sure. Uh, the, the film at this point, we've been, again, uh, uh, something that sets it apart from other films is that we actually have been, uh, we, I pretty much approach it as though I'm developing open source uh, open source so software and so these I beta screenings for no example MRE, make, that's make right so degree. so we actually About have been screening every she few months for the past uh, year and a half from it's alpha to beta it's kind of tongue-in-cheek because it's kind of like um, a uh, in a sense Twitter, um a head nod to the, the tech community wonder. and the way that they they develop products and all that so uh we we screen every few months and then we uh share with the Twitter community, the social media community, and we incorporate the feedback um, into the making of the film. So, for, exa for example, for the beta screenings, we actually have a Twitter wall next to the projection screen, and we do a very evil thing where we egg people on, on the tweet during the movie. And sometimes people were, at first people were self-conscious because it's kind of rude to tweet during a movie, but I keep telling people that it's a great compliment to me for this film, sure. please, during the movie. And so we look at the buzz online, look at the Twitter stream and incorporate the comments into the shaping of the film. Um, in the coming months, because the film is largely done, we are going to um, finish a final round of beta screenings uh, to gather feedback from in, uh, in US and uh, in London. And then we will make a festival debut, a film festival debut in August or September. Um, and then the film will, will be seen in some more traditional ways, probably a limited theater release and et cetera, et cetera. You will go through the cycles of, uh, of distribution. See, okay, so, I noticed that uh, you've got uh, donate buttons on your website um, that yeah. says uh, profits from screenings, for example, will be donated to charity. I mean, is this a donation, completely donation-based project? Or did you put a lot of your own money into it? And, I, you know, what, what are you expecting to get back? Is it just a fun <laughs> experiment or, or are you wanting to make uh, some cash? Cash? Uh, well, it's not easy <laughs> to make cash from an uh, independent film. I... It's interesting because people have asked me, um, I remember after a screening in Kuala Lumpur, a, uh, a lady, came, come, a young woman came up to me and said, why did you make this film? And then she asked me three times. And it's like, kind of, kind of mystifies people why um, I'll put so much of my time into a project like this with no obvious um, uh, payoff, I guess, because it's a very ex experimental way to make a film. Um, I think my answer to that is really, um, in terms of the what goes into the film, in terms of investment, of course, I put in some of my own money. But at the same time, because of the collaborative nature of it, actually a lot of the cost is shared by people who came along to collaborate with me uh, uh, in terms of contributing their time, their, their effort, uh, their creative um, energy. So the cost is actually shared by the people who come along and help me. Um, and in terms of what I seek out of this, I, I always say that uh, um, although fame and fortune will be nice, um, it's unlikely <laughs> for an independent film about Twitter. I think, I think it's actually the quest for understanding. It's really to understand, uh, make sense of the impact of social media on, on us, on the, the way we define ourselves, on the way we connect with one another. Because I think that there's been a whole lot of um, news about about social media, about Twitter, but there's not a lot of making sense. Like, what does it mean? 
how ha how have the way we 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 live our lives changed? How have the way we make friends changed? How have the way that we work we play changed? And I really want to understand that on one level. Um, but on another level, as a storyteller, I also want to understand how social media has changed the way that we tell stories, uh, uh, changed the way that we define roles of uh, the storyteller, the filmmaker, and the audience. So one of the things I find fascinating is that um, it's really what I often call the breaking of the fourth wall. Because um, in, in live theater, what happens is that an actor breaks the fourth wall when when they, they break out of that fictional reality and start talking to the audience. You know, they, they, they start relating to the audience as a, as in, in real life, so to speak. And uh, I find that on social media, the, the filmmaker is no longer kind of hidden away from the, uh, from the audience. And what's really interesting is really that, in my case, the, the interviewees, the people I film, the, uh, the audience, often crossed over and start helping the film. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, one of the producers of, for the film uh, actually uh, came on board after attending a work in progress screening in Singapore. He just decided that uh, he, he loved the film so much that he wants to help it go as far as it can. So, wow, so that's the, a great story. Roles, the roles become much more fluid. You know, people are not playing fixed roles. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, the audience can take part in various ways. They can tweet about the film. They can... Which they, they can actually are doing. I mean, you linked to your website the keyword for Twittermentary. And I mean, it's no secret that, that folks who love Twitter would would want to to back something about Twitter, right? I mean, it's it's almost the perfect audience, really, to spread the word. Yeah, I, and I think also because um, I my conviction from the beginning and why I made this film in this very convoluted way, that there's actually an easier way to, to make the film in a traditional way. It's because I feel that the film about Twitter that will be embraced by the Twitter community is a film that not only is a good film in terms of the substance of it and the story about Twitter, it's the film that actually reflects and mirrors and celebrates the, the open culture on Twitter. So that mm. when people see the film, they actually say, oh, this filmmaker gets Twitter. You know, instead of saying, oh, this is some outsider, this is some journalist that decided one, one day to make a film about Twitter. So I think it's really, I think for me, the process of making it is just as important as what's in the film. Because I think yeah. then, over time, the community begins to see itself in the film, which is what sets this film apart from a film where I go and read three books and 50 articles about Twitter and then sit and decide to and plan my shoot. So I think that the ethos is important. The sense of co-creating it is very important so that uh, um, the film, and also the other thing about using Twitter is I feel there's no greater testimonial for the film is if we use Twitter well to market the film. You know, mm -hmm. it's the obvious thing. If we don't know how to use Twitter to market the film, we shouldn't be sharing it on Twitter. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a simple thing. Yeah. Well, you've done a great job of uh, getting the word out. Uh, you know, I heard about it uh, by email and looked it up on Twitter and saw all the buzz around it. So good luck with everything. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, um, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in taking a look at the documentary. It seems like uh, it's going to be a, a big hit. Absolutely. Yeah, I, Siok Siok Tan, thanks so much for joining us. This was really interesting. I, I'm, I'm very excited to watch this movie. How long will it be? 17 minutes, seven zero minutes. 17. Okay, so so, so, oh, it's, yeah. so it's over an hour, but a, certainly a, um, a nice, um, easy for audience viewers to watch on a big screen. No one's going to get too, too jumpy or tired. 70 minutes, though, oh. that's amazing. I, can, I, can I quickly interject? Because I, I just thought, in, as an illustration of the, the way that people help, this interview is set up by, by Daniel Cervantes, who actually came to support the film. He organized the screening in Kuala Lumpur and also helped to set up this interview, introduce me to you, the two of you. Oh, wow. That's an example of, of the help I've been getting. People set up interviews, they research stories for, for me, they uh, set up screenings, um, and all spontaneously. So, so there's a lot of uh, uh, help that comes from people who, 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 who like the film and like the idea of the film. And, and that's been really a very 
um, amazing story. The film, making of the film and the sharing of the film is a, a great story about Twitter in itself. So where can people go to uh, just get updates on the film and uh, uh, watch some of the clips? It, it, uh, is it your website, twittermentary.com? Yeah, the, the website is T-W-I-T-T-A-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. So it's Twitter Mentory. And we, we are doing a series of uh, beta screenings. There's, a, there's one on the com Monday, a few couple of days from now in Singapore. At the end of June, we'll be go doing Los Angeles, uh, New York, and uh, London. Um, so, so, so there are various ways for people to catch the film, and hopefully uh, we'll, we will get more and more people to see it. But the website is definitely the place to go for the latest information, tweets, screening information screening uh, information. So so that's the best place to go. And the Twitter Very handle. Cool. The Twitter handle. Yeah. Well, well, good luck and uh, get some sleep. It's uh, 3 a.m. over there and I'm sure you're tired, but uh, you do not appear uh, as though you're up in the middle of the night and uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show. We really do. Thanks, Thanks so much for joining us. Siok Siok Tan, the director of Twitamentary, coming soon to a theater near you or a virtual Thank screening you. as well. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Bye -bye. Amber, I love this idea. A I know. documentary I know. about Twitter. Could it be even more perfect for people like us? I know. And you know, I just we'd be just listening to her talk and the story of how many so many people how so many people are helping her. I mean, I think she explained it very well how that just shows you the power of Twitter and the community out there. And I mean, if you're open to it and you're kind of accepting of people helping you and you're not freaked out by the by the idea of strangers coming in and um, lending you a hand, I think that you know, Twitter can be such an amazing tool for so many people. And there's just, you know, another example from the other side of the world. Absolutely agree. Yeah, really cool stuff. I, I, uh, I, I did, I did, you know, when I told her, I, hey, I noticed some people, they weren't in the teaser that we watched, but folks, it wasn't mm. actually on her website or I would have run through a few of them, but uh, somebody else had written up Twittermentary or, or the, um, the, the documentary that was coming and had a list of some Twitter personalities. Drew Olinoff was, I mean, he sticks out um. in my mind as, as he, uh, he's one of my Twitter friends, you know, I mean, I see him in life very mm -hmm. rarely. Uh, He's that Drew on Twitter. Uh, some folks may already be familiar with him, but I thought, oh, really cool. I mean, she seemed to get a very wide, um, d a different, uh, a lot of different types of people yeah. um, to participate, yeah. which is really cool. I mean, it's, it's, it's very cool. You know, it's, it's funny. It's like, it can, it's, it, I can see some people saying, oh, this seems really navel gazing, you know, a documentary about people who love Twitter talking about Twitter, but there really is such a larger conversation about how it's changed the way people communicate with each other. I mean, mm -hmm. we're a really good product of that. And and it is interesting that that people use Twitter for so many different ways and and have so many different feelings about what it's good for and, and you know, how it's doing good things and how it's not doing good things, you know, how it changes oh, yeah. conversations for good and bad. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, there's no uh, end to the stories, uh, which I know we have a story coming up, but I think we have an ad first, but our story will also be about Twitter and mm -hmm. uh, the human side of Twitter. Yeah, exactly. We, uh, yeah, we have a lot more coming up on the show. Documentary about Twitter is just one aspect of the social hour, of course, because we talk about all sorts of stuff. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, what is this social hour and where can I find more information about it? We are on episode 10. We've done nine other episodes. You can always go to twit.tv slash TSH. That's our website. Um, all of our show archives are there as well as really handy dandy subscribe links. So uh, sometimes Amber and I, uh, we, we always, uh, well, I was going to say we always record the show on Mondays at 11 a.m. <laughs> Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. But that's not always true because we're busy folks and sometimes we shoot the show at different times. Today, for example, um, we're shooting at a different time because of the impending Memorial Weekend. But if, if, you, if you can't keep up with that or you think, I just can't catch up with you guys all the time and sometimes I don't want to miss the show, just subscribe. Uh, you don't have to watch the show live. It's always fun to have you here and participating in our chat room. But if for whatever reason you can't, don't worry about it. If you just subscribe, a variety of different ways. You can go through iTunes, but but you have options there. You can subscribe to the show and then watch us on demand, which is really, it, that's easy. So you don't even have to think about it. We'll just show up. And then when you have time, you can catch yeah, up with can, us. You can listen in the car and uh, we can keep you amused for, uh, well, not hours, but definitely 
one hour. Yes. Maybe a little bit <laughs> One hour uh, plus some change. Uh, we want to thank uh, Squarespace for being one of the sponsors of our show today. Squarespace.com slash social hour is the URL to go to if you're looking to create a very high quality website or blog. If you're not familiar with Squarespace and you want to, I don't know, get your thoughts out there. I mean, you saw Siok's really interesting idea. She put a website together around a documentary that she shot. She could use Squarespace and make it look really, really beautiful. Squarespace is, you know, you can you can write blog posts, you can embed videos. There's a uh, there's uh, really beautiful formatting for Flickr photos or Twitter widgets. I mean, if you're a photographer and you've got um, a lot of stuff that you want to display, even you want to sell. Uh, you want people. Yeah, there's to, great galleries. Yeah, exactly. You want people to be able to contact you easily. Maybe you want to run forums. Maybe you, you know, you've got discussion forums, and you're trying to get a community of folks together. Squarespace can actually handle all of that stuff. If you actually go to there, I always want to point people to their examples page. Squarespace.com again slash social hour. If you click on examples, you get such a good idea of all the different, all the different layouts that that people have created. I mean, they're really Far and wide, they encompass a lot, um, like Wagging Tails, for example, which is a business. Hope Revo, which is a, uh, a nonprofit, which is actually um, put together by somebody who works at Squarespace, um, who oh, helped cool. me with my layout. Yeah, so Squarespace is, it's, you, can, you can put together a website from scratch, um, and it's easy, actually. Um, or you can customize, you know, if you, if you want something that's extremely original and unique and you want to put a lot of effort into it, you can do that too. Uh, building something is as easy or as complex as you would like to make it. They have very good import-export options as well. So if you already yeah, have a blog somewhere. That. It's very cool that you can just uh, port over all your content if you're running a, a, a site using another one of the popular platforms out there like WordPress. It's really easy to transfer it over to Squarespace. I think it works as well with TypePad, uh, Blogger, and Movable Type. Yeah, that's very true. They also allow you to export your content as well. So Squarespace isn't going to make it difficult for you to do what you want to do with the content that, of course, you own. They have really good metrics, too. Um, Leo and I are always talking about how <laughs> when we look at our metrics, we're like, we we need to start blogging more. Look, our numbers are going down. But that's really interesting. I mean, it's good to know where your viewers, your audience uh, members are coming from, who's hitting your site every day. If you blog every day, are you gaining a lot of folks? I mean, it's really good incentives to be able to look at your numbers and yeah. just get a sense of, of, of what you're doing and who you're reaching and how it's affecting folks. Squarespace.com. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's some sometimes a blog post will really resonate with people, and, and and maybe it's what you hoped, and maybe it's you know a surprise. You can also access Squarespace. Um, I love accessing them on my iPad. Um, they've really made some improvements too to the app since they first released it. It's beautiful. It works really well for blogging on the go. I also um, almost exclusively manage my comments um, through um, through the iPad app now, just because it's so easy. Um, they have a really clean beautiful layout. It's good stuff. Squarespace.com slash social hour is the website. And we thank them so much for sponsoring this episode of the social hour. You know, blogging is social, Amber, or it's as social as you want it to be anyway. Well, exactly. And uh, we have a great article that uh, you put in the lineup about uh, being social and how really social media is all about people. And although there are many organizations that try to replace people with bots and uh, automation, sometimes that just doesn't work that well. And you need to get those individuals back in the mix. And a perfect example is uh, the New York Times and uh, how they, uh, I guess, were automating all of their tweets and then decided not to do it anymore. Yeah, it sounds like, um, and I, I have a theory for why they're doing this. It sounds like what the New York Times had done up until recently is they pretty much anytime anyone wrote an article in the New York Times, the, the New York Times official Twitter app would tweet out a, um, you know, a link to, to the article. And if you were following that account, then you would just not miss a thing. But there wasn't anything very personal about it. You didn't get the sense that somebody was um, behind the screen typing, hey, check out this article by so-and-so who works at the New York Times. Here's why you might like it. Here's the link. So it, it, it was feeling very bot-like. Um, so the New York Times said, hey, we're going now to, to make it a little bit more personal. It's going to be the same NY Times Twitter account that many people 
many people already follow, but it's going to have a little bit more of a personality-driven tweeting um, spin. Um, in fact, the the actual tweet that let people know what they were doing said, "This week, El Heron and Lexi NYT will be tweeting from this account. What do you want to see?" So they're they're um, they're asking for a little bit more feedback. They probably looked at their at replies and realized. You know, there's not a lot of back and forth yeah. going on here. Maybe we're doing this wrong. I think that this has to do with the N uh, New York Times firewall, perhaps, and the fact that if you go through the New York Times through a link on Twitter, then the firewall, you can still read an article even if you're hitting mm -hmm. your limit. And if they make it more of a personal thing, that, that might have something to do with people not just maybe... Uh, um, hitting the New York Times Twitter account through Flipboard, for example, and it being almost as if they're reading the entire magazine for free. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. And I think just in general, you know, like I touched on before, I think people really are on Twitter because it's like a cocktail party. You know, it's a conversation and you meet individuals and they have opinions and and uh, they love the site that there's a, there's a human face behind most Twitter accounts. And so I, I just think the idea of automation is sort of something that's a bit dated and just generally speaking doesn't work anymore. But obviously uh, they could have other motives as well. Nonetheless, I think it's a, a move in the right direction and uh, uh, hopefully it does well for them as far as, uh, I mean, I know they have a lot of followers already, but, uh, you know, giving them even more and, and enhancing that sense of community around their content. Exactly. Especially since I, I would assume that because of the firewall issues, maybe they are trying to, you know, they know that their audience may shrink a bit, but mm -hmm. the audience that they have, they know is very engaged and wants to participate in the conversation that much more yeah. than just, you know, maybe the casual person who's following the New York Times or following their Twitter account who, exactly. who's, who's sort of engaged, but maybe missing some stuff. So I, I agree with you. I think the, the human element of it, even if there are other reasons than just to be, you know, Mm -hmm. more conversational is for the most part good because we tend yeah. to it's easy to tune out stuff that you know um it, it feels automated you know or feels like an ad um yeah. it's just you know designed to get more views not necessarily to to spur a conversation it feels like spam i mean really at the end of the day i think so um Actually, speaking, not that this has anything to do with spam, but uh, <laughs> the only reason I will say this is I've been reading so much about TechCrunch Disrupt, you know, yeah. the conference that has been going on recently. Um, every time I turn around and I check out TechCrunch's site, you know, there's articles about different companies who have been presenting there and conversations. Obviously, look like a fantastic event. Uh, it looks like the uh, winner of uh, the Disrupt uh, competition is a company called Get Around. And this is a really cool concept. Uh, the idea being that, I guess, people who own cars, they actually only drive their cars about 8% of the time. So their cars are just sitting there. So they pay all this money and they pay for insurance and yet people aren't using them. So this app allows you to rent a car from someone nearby, uh, a really convenient p way for people to get access to a car and also for people who own cars to be able to take advantage of, um, you know, maybe making a little bit of money while they're paying all their uh, fees already. Yeah, so at Disrupt, they have a bunch of, it's almost like a, yeah, it's like a startups uh, competing against each other to get the grand prize and get around ended up being uh, the, the one that won. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the best in show. So, for example, this is in the San Francisco area, of course, and, and it get around is, is there's, there's sort of an experimental uh, stage right now. Um, so they're not in every metropolitan area, but in the mm -hmm. San Francisco area, um, th this gentleman has a beautiful BMW, a uh, little rich for my blood, but I could rent the BMW mm -hmm. for $15 per hour. If for whatever reason, maybe I was thinking of buying one, or maybe I wanted to impress some friends who were coming in for the weekend, or maybe I just, I don't know, wanted, got a wild hair and decided to go grocery shopping, um, in a car that's nicer than the one I have. He's got pictures <laughs> here. Um, so it's almost like, it's almost... It, it, it feels like if you were actually just shopping to buy a car, you know, from a yeah. private, from a private I think it's seller. A really, it's a really great idea. Um, you know, as long as you can maintain that uh, or ensure that the people renting the cars are trustworthy. And it seems as though there are different steps that you have to go through to make sure that that is the case. Um, so a really, a really cool concept. And uh, hopefully uh, they do well. And there's some great buzz around them right now. Yeah, some of the, some of the most obvious questions, I think, are... Um, uh, you know, ha what about insurance? I mean, what if I rent this guy's car? I'm driving around yeah. in his BMW and I get rear-ended. What happens? Well, mm -hmm. and, and who knows how this will this will play out? But at least off the top, Get Around says they include insurance. 
They're backed by America's largest insurance companies. Their coverage includes liability, collision, property damage, uninsured motorist protection type of thing. So, I mean, it's pretty standard. It sounds pretty good. They obviously are going to have to have that be rock Mm. solid so that people, you know, there aren't liability issues and people say, I can't use get around because... Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not covered or I'm, I'm unsure about the seller. There's also the idea that cars depreciate in value. So it's, mm, it's exactly, you know, it's, it's gosh, you know, if, even if I wasn't driving my car and I knew I would never drive my car on Saturdays. Yeah. So it's like, why not rent it out and get a little bit of money? That sounds yeah. great. But even if someone's treating my car with the utmost in care, and then, you know, that's contributing to that 30,000 miles where at the end of it, I have to spend $1,000 to get my car tuned up type thing. So it's a really cool concept. It's like Airbnb for cars. It would be interesting to see who who uses it. I know, I know. We should try to get them on the show. Maybe I'll try to track them down if they're not too swamped and busy for us, Sarah. Yes, but, absolutely. Uh, hopefully we can track them down. Hey, Sarah, I was wondering, while you introduce this next story, would you mind if I just ran and take my contacts out? I'm having serious problems with them. They're like so dry. My eyes are going crazy. Oh, and I want not to put my a problem on. at all. No, do it. Is that it. okay? Do it. Yeah, okay. in fact, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about our next story because this is something okay. that, that I found this morning. So when, when I get up in the morning, I roll over, I grab my iPhone and I read my Twitter feed. You know, I catch up on everything until I find the tweet that was the last one I read before I went to bed the night before. What can I say? I'm addicted. And a lot of folks were tweeting this morning about this Tumblr blog, a, a Tumblr blog that, that somebody had, um, a post that somebody had set up. I'm not familiar with her. Uh, But she's got a tumble log called I Make Shiny Things. And apparently she's also um, an Etsy seller. She makes beautiful jewelry. Well, it turns out that she makes a particular kind of necklace that she claims Urban Outfitters has completely ripped off. So she what she did was she took a screenshot of Urban Outfitters, a page with a necklace they have on sale. That's a picture of a state, a little heart in the middle of it. So it's like a, you know, variety of a variety of states um, with a heart. So, you know, you. You would, I guess, buy the state that you live in or, you know, a state that you used to love or something like that. Well, the problem that she has with it is that she did, she thought of it first. And so she links to her own um, website, which she also sells through Etsy, um, that that is strikingly uh, familiar. In fact, to the point where she says, hey, Urban Outfitters straight up ripped me off and I want to get the word out and I'm upset about it and I'm not going to shop from them and yeah. I don't think you should either. And the reason that you know I became familiar with this is that, like I said, I probably wouldn't have come across this, but some of my friends on Twitter were retweeting this. You know, horrible. Urban Outfitters rips off artist. I make shiny love. That's her Twitter handle. Um, another one of my friends, Urban Outfitters is at it again, stealing designs, sadness. And what's interesting is um, the the artist uh, had said in her post. And this is just another example of Urban out- Outfitters ripping off artists. Well, she linked to um, a, an article that's about a year old from the Village Voice um, from last year that was about this exact same thing. It was about whether or not it's coincidental or it's a ripoff that Urban Outfitters is now displaying, you know, they have jewelry on sale that looks exactly like or very, very similar to other people's uh, design ideas, and they have so a few Sarah, examples has, has Urban Out- Outfitters responded at all? Have they publicly come out on, on Twitter or anywhere and said anything about it? Well, not that I can find, mm. at least not since we started doing the show. Um, although I assume that they're going to have to because this has really blown up my Twitter feed. I mean, people are, it's just, it's the sort of thing where it seems, and again, they should respond and, you know, I yeah. don't, I don't want to make judgments that they, yeah. But, you know, this is what I don't understand, you know, if this is, so when did you first hear about this? Sorry if I missed that off the top of your No, it's okay. It was when I woke up this morning, I noticed everyone on, well, not everyone, but many of my friends on Twitter were kind of spreading the word about mm. this woman's uh, Tumblr post that Urban Outfitters had done her wrong, you know, and of course not get, given her credit and, you know, she does this for a living. So that's how I found out about it. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, how many times the story has been shared since then, probably quite a few, because these things tend to spread like wildfire. And it's, it's, I cannot stress how important it is for companies out there, if you're a community manager, that you need to address these things in a timely manner. So here we are, you know, it's almost uh, the end of the day on Friday. This Mm -hmm. has been going on. I mean, all Urban Outfitters has to do, 
assuming they're on Twitter or uh, any other social network, is to put out a statement and say they're looking into this uh, instead of just, you know, being totally um, oblivious that it's happening or appearing oblivious. Because in this day and age, you cannot be a big company like that without having your ear to the digital ground. I, I hate that term, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the the... It's interesting because it's like, listen, if they actually did rip um, an independent artist off, then mm -hmm. I mean, it's obviously uh, such a no-no. You know, I mean, you look at these two pictures and it's like, again, I don't know either party involved. So I couldn't yeah. begin to speculate on what exactly happened here. You know, maybe it was an employee who liked the design and just went a little bit too far and the company, you know, as a whole wasn't in on something nefarious. Who knows? But you do look at the two designs and you think, man, if I was that artist and this was my livelihood, I would be mm. mad and I would take it to the streets, at least the, you know, the internet streets anyway, to try to yeah. get the word across as much as possible to get at the very least an apology and at the very most some compensation for, mm. for something, you know, for, for, uh, for getting just ripped an off. explanation. I mean, just getting out there and saying something and kind of defending your position. I mean, I think everybody has to do that just to um, start to become part of that conversation. So um, we'll have to keep on top of the story and uh, watch if they actually come out and do anything. Because I think what the tendency for a lot of big companies and brands like this is to kind of sit on these stories. And so they mm -hmm. won't necessarily respond or react and they'll take a few days and maybe they'll talk to their PR team. But social media is moving too quickly for that. You cannot waste time. You need to react more quickly and get involved a lot more faster or a lot faster than you think you do. So uh, we'll see what happens next week. Indeed. Indeed we will. Amber, I thought we, we talked about this a little bit before the show. And so I thought we'd introduce a new little segment um, called Pass It On, which is... I love it. Thank you. Good. Yeah, I thought of it myself. Actually, I didn't. Uh, the reason that I thought of it was because we're constantly getting, you and I both, and everybody can, can, can empathize. It's like, you're getting all these great ideas all week long from, from folks where someone will say, oh, this is a great site, check it out. And some of these sites aren't actually social networking uh, or inherently socially built sites in and of themselves, but they're shared with us socially. So why not share them with all of you in the same social way? Because we're a social show after all. Uh, the first site that I want to- um, You shall drink when Sarah says social. Exactly, oh gosh, they would be. <laughs> alcohol poisoned um, or, or water or just drink some water. You know, it's important to be hydrated. Just so you know, Sarah, I don't want to get you off track. Sorry to interrupt you. But on the East Coast of Canada, uh, particularly in places like Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, when people are actually out and they're drinking, they say sociable and they, they cheers each other. And really? Then they, oh, yeah, it's a, a, a custom uh, that uh, is pretty prevalent out there. Sociable. Sociable. Huh? Yeah. That's funny. And then they drink. Yeah, oh, cool. just to FYI, in case you ever want to turn this into a drinking game, which I do not necessarily condone, but uh, nonetheless, people, users or, or viewers can do it on their own. Oh, I love that. Well, we could call the segment sociable. It doesn't have to be called <laughs> Pass It On. That was just the first thing that came to my head. But no, anyway, like this site is really a friend of mine had bought a print from a site called 20 by 200. So that's 20, the letter X, 200, um, and the 20 and the 200 are numbers.com where yeah, this is a great site. I'd never heard of it before, but she had bought a print and tweeted out with a, a Instagram picture um, connected saying, oh, I got my new print from 20 by 200. I really, really like it. So I went to the site and it this is a great um, uh, site to get uh, photographs that are not that expensive from very talented artists who are making a little bit of money because they have talent and you know don't necessarily own their own gallery or be able to display their photos in someone else's gallery um, for example let's just say that I was interested in this print it's called Road to Bonville Raceway and it's in Utah and it's by someone named Stuart Clipper well, I love this picture. It's really cool. I mean, it's very kind of like salt flats type of a thing. Well, mm -hmm. if I wanted an 11 by 14 print of this, and it's, this is sort of this nice, big, wide, it looks so good over a couch, you know, it's $50. Um, wow. that's, a, that's a nice big print. Now, if I wanted to go up to 20 by 24, it's $500. 30 by 40, 2000 So, I mean, you know, the, there are price discrepancies depending on what you're looking for. But some of this artwork that's really cool, you know, starts at 20 bucks. That's for example, great. traveling an eight by ten for twenty dollars. Um, I buy prints all the time, Amber, that are that are cheap-ish, and you know, obviously the 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 price goes up once you frame it, and you know, if you want to yeah. do a matting and that kind of thing. But but just to buy a print, you know, in a store, twenty dollars, I'd be like, wow, this is a real oh, steal. Know. 
And it's so original. That's what I love. I'm just uh, poking around the site and all of the artwork is, you know, it's not something you're going to see on your friend's wall, right? It's not like Ikea mass produced uh, uh, pictures. So uh, it seems a fun way not only to support artists, but also, uh, you know, have a little individuality in your design choices at home. Yeah, exactly. I love this. 20by200.com. Browse some art. Um, support some some artists who are who are getting their names out there and doing a lot of good work. A lot of photography, um, a lot of illustrative uh, kind mm -hmm. of art. So it really runs the gamut. Um, my friends, so, um, my friends, the art that she got it was actually just it said modern art equals. I could draw that plus yeah, but you didn't, which I thought was really <laughs> funny. That's very. I was cute. like ah, that's so clever, and now I can't buy it because. She already bought it, but yeah. So, so it was okay. it was a, it was a very cool site and shared socially. So we're passing Pass it, on. it on exactly. On. All right, Sarah. So uh, we have uh, some great stuff coming up, uh, especially our segment where we talk about the viewer and uh, listener feedback, which is so much fun. Yes. Uh, but before we do that, I know we have an ad from FreshBooks. And I was thinking of a fun thing that we could do with FreshBooks, aside from talking about all of their features, is maybe at the beginning of each FreshBooks ad, because I am such a huge fan, I could say, I love FreshBooks because, and then mm -hmm. I could do like a statement. And the reason I say this is because I have a statement for today, which is, I love FreshBooks because FreshBooks makes my accountant love me. And uh, the <laughs> <laughs> reason I say this, my accountant just left my house probably uh, an hour and a half ago. And uh, it was the first year where he had come to do all of my accounting because for businesses in Canada, uh, if you're on your, your own business, uh, your taxes are due June 15th. I actually said to me, said, okay, well, I need all your revenue for last year and all the invoices you sent normally. I'm like rushing around to find everything. And I was like, oh, here you go, David. Here's my login to my FreshBooks account. So he literally went in there. Everything was organized. He just outputted everything and it was done within just a few minutes. So now my accountant loves me. So thank Thank you, FreshBooks. Oh, Amber, that's a great story. Wow. So you guys are, everyone in Canada is stressing out over their tax season. Uh, we well, we had that a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. We have the same thing in, in April if you're uh, employed by someone else. But if you're self-employed, it's due in June. June. So June is the big, the FreshBooks folks are loving June because they don't have to run around trying to find those invoice emails that they sent to that one company on that one day. If you guys are confused as to what we're talking about, FreshBooks is the absolute best solution for anybody who's doing contract work. I mean, you know, it's, a lot of people are employed by one company and they, they're a staff member and they, you know, they get a check twice a month or whatever, but there are so many other of us that, that do a lot of work on the side. And when, mm -hmm. you, when, you, ha when you have jobs like that, you have to invoice a client um, to get the money that you guys agreed would be paid to you for your work. And that can be a huge hassle um, it can be really hard to organize that all, especially when it comes, you know, to, to giving that information to your accountant and keeping track of all of your money. And that's where FreshBook comes in. Uh, it's free uh, to sign up. It's very easy to get going. You even get three clients. You can just connect to three clients for free. It'll never cost you a dime. If you have a lot of clients, then that's great because you're probably getting more money. Uh, the rates are really affordable and FreshBooks makes it easy to get paid a variety of different ways. I mean, PayPal, um, you can have direct deposit into your bank account. You can get checks mailed back and forth. I mean, FreshBooks will go through the mail if that's what you want or if that's what your clients want. Um, there are... Uh, there are mobile apps. So, you know, if you're on the go and, and you've got an iPhone, you can definitely use that to just kind of keep track of, 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 of the hours that you're racking up. Hourly billing is, is part of the deal. If that's, if that's the kind of way that you work, FreshBooks will work with you in that way. And they'll also set up automatic reminders. So if you've got a client that you work with regularly and for whatever reason they need a little nudge, um, or they or they just like to have a monthly reminder, let's say. FreshBooks will just do all of that for you. I mean, it tr tr truly automates. It's almost like having an accountant, Amber. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. So uh, uh, if you don't have an accountant, uh, it will be like having one. If you have an accountant, your accountant will love you. And uh, that is reason enough to uh, use FreshBooks. Absolutely. FreshBooks.com is the URL. Amber can vouch for them. <laughs> Um, I like your stories. It really adds Thank that you. personal feel. I'm no? going to do that every week. I'm going to tell you a story. About Very Fresh good. Because I have a story every week. Yeah, Hopefully you Hopefully they're okay with that, FreshBooks. <laughs> I'm sure they are. I'm sure. FreshBooks.com is awesome. Yes. Invoicing, just make it easy on yourself. Do it. Do it for us. Even if not for yourself, you'll thank us. All right. So let's get into some viewer feedback. Yeah. I love so, the viewer feedback. Do you want to read this first email? 
Um, yeah. So uh, basically the first email is from Jen and Jen has written to us about uh, clout or its relevance or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. She says, uh, I'm not sure how active you were all on Tumblr in the past, but it used to have a similar thing called Tumblrity. Uh, it was based on your follower count, how many posts you made, your numbers and all those type of things. Uh, the competition aspect of it, which was derived from some private algorithm involving a combination of numbers. Um, she's saying, while well, Tumblr never said Tumblrality was a competition, they did introduce global global and local leaderboards on everyone's dashboard. Uh, she's saying that uh, many people were on the fence about it uh, in the same ways that people are on the fence about clout. Uh, after they scrapped it, there was a period of time where tumblers were up in arms, either positively or uh, some negatively. Um, she's just saying that she's interested in uh, what we think of Tumblrity and its similarities to clout. Um, and if you think uh, people would have the same reaction if clout stopped being viewed as uh, relevant, just like Tumblrity experience. So uh, I didn't know that actually i didn't know they had that uh during a period of uh, of uh, their time uh they had something like that where they actually rated different tumblr users yeah they did you know it's it's funny i hadn't really realized that tumblrity went away um because i didn't pay too much attention to it because like jen said it it bothered me a little bit because it became something where People wanted to have um, a better Tumblrity rating as a, you know, wh when compared with other people. Um, mm -hmm. And that is always, you know, we just talked about this. That that's always, that can be dangerous because then it's like, well, what's your incentive? Are you blogging because you love what you're doing? Are you, you know, you connecting with folks? Or are you just trying to raise a score that doesn't really mean anything to most people? And Tumblr did have this for a while. And the the numbers of, of everyone's Tumblrity were public. So it was definitely something where you could compare your score, for lack of a better word, to someone else's. I don't think mine was ever very high because I, again, never really used Tumblr um, as regularly as some people did. Sure. And it's also not my only blogging platform. But it's interesting that Jen compares it to Clout because I can't figure out how on Clout to compare my number with someone else. Um, and, the, and the reason that this I even decided to try was because Kevin Rose yesterday or the day before had tweeted out my clout score is 75 and then he tweeted out right after that oh well I just don't know what anyone else's score is so I kind of wish there was a way to see like you know a uh, leaderboard yeah. or something of the top clout mean? users so I know if 75 is high or low or somewhere mm -hmm. in between so I went ahead and I um I, I signed into Clout through Facebook. In fact, I can sign in again here. And my score was like 45 or something. So it's like, well, Kevin's is higher than mine, but I still don't really know why, you know, why, why? What, what, the, what, the, what the difference is between the two of us. Um, and that was, you know, it's kind of like, I'm not sure what's better. I'm not sure if having mm. a score that is something that, it's almost like if my score is 45 and I want it to become 50, I'll start tweeting more and linking to other folks and, and I feel better if it rises. Yeah. Um, or if it's better to compete with somebody else in the Tumblrity way. I mean, obviously yeah. Tumblr felt that probably they got enough negative feedback so that they, they dropped the feature. You know, maybe it kind of felt ugly or something well, to too many people. probably discourages people out there who are using Tumblr, especially maybe that they feel as though they, you know, they're not doing a good enough job and maybe they don't want to use the service anymore. I mean, with cloud, it's one of those things you have to kind of know about it and go discover it. It's not as though it's just listed on your Twitter page. And I think that would be horrible. I don't think people would necessarily like that. Uh, so I think it's just one of those things. I mean, there's so much competition in other parts of our lives, I feel like. In social media, the thing that I love about it is just kind of like this equal playing field. If you only have 100 users on Twitter, you still have the possibility to get you know your voice heard by people all around the world and even if it's not thousands and thousands of people maybe it's just people who matter so um i'm still kind of of the mindset that well i think you could got to kind of take these things with a grain of salt and, and not take them too far and i have no idea um you know why one person's would be better than the other except for the fact that maybe you know they're being retweeted more and you know, more yeah. conversations and those type of things, just sort of standard things that they must base it on. Also, I, and, and I feel like I, I don't want to be too dismissive of clout because it, a lot of this looks really cool. My score is 59. Sorry, it's not 45. But it's still, when I look at my analysis, clout says, well, your score has fallen in the past month. But, Aww. you know, you're stabilized. So, But I, it's like, I don't, nothing has really changed in the way that I use 
anything socially. You know, my internet usage, at, at least as far as I can tell, hasn't changed in the last month. So I don't know how this has helped, except to maybe yeah. make me feel a little bit bad. Exactly. <laughs> but and the thing is, so what if it's changed? So what if for the past month, like, you know, I'll take myself for an example. Let's say if my clout score right after I had my son two years ago really dropped for weeks and weeks because I just wasn't on these sites so much. Like, clout doesn't know that. It's too dumb to recognize those human experiences. <laughs> so Very true. I just think it's one of those things where it's just, you know, it, it can only say so much. And, and the reality is, is, you know, maybe you, you dropped off for a bit for a reason, but it, it just doesn't affect things. And I think also the name, like, you know, in some ways, I almost think they would have been better off naming themselves something else. I realize that cloud, it obviously it resonates and people kind of get the idea of what it means. But saying cloud is it puts it into the category of being a total popularity contest. And I, I just think that's something that sort of should be avoided a little bit. Yeah, totally agree with you there. We got another email from, who was this email from? From Ed Gray. He lives mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, and he says, Hello, Amber and Sarah. I'm enjoying the new show. I'm a regular listener. I wanted to respond to your discussion about the value of LinkedIn. This was our discussion um, in the past episode. Oh, gosh. iTunes licensing agreement just popped up on the whatever. Oh, that does that all the time to me. Yeah. yeah well, I was just trying to open a video, but I guess iTunes isn't set up on this account. Anyway, uh, we talked about uh, LinkedIn's IPO in our last episode and just kind of like how we use it and do we think that, you know, it's relevant and, and so on and so forth. Ooh, let me just, uh, this is actually our, I see what's going on here. Our, our next video question Ooh. just popped up in, in, uh, in iTunes. But back to Ed. So he said, I uh, wanted to respond to your discussion about the value of LinkedIn and what people do on the site because it's not just about resumes and contacts, which, you know, I, I, that's what I use it for. Ed says, I would encourage you to check out the many discussion groups. For example, one of the groups I follow is for WordPress. There are many sites and blogs on the Internet about WordPress, but I keep going back to the LinkedIn group because the discussions are with ordinary people that just use WordPress in their business on a regular basis. And the discussion is focused. It's practical. I can learn something. I can help other people. There are lots of groups on pretty much every topic on LinkedIn. Granted, some will be more active than others, but my experience has been really positive. I belong to groups about Macs, open source software, programming, even running. I work for a women's college, and our alumni and student LinkedIn groups are also very active. Keep up the good work. I have never really thought about using LinkedIn for this reason. Amber, I don't know if you yeah. do or not, but it kind of news to me. I think it's great. You know what? I've heard really great things about LinkedIn groups. I don't use it a lot. And it's probably because so much of my sort of chatty conversation happens publicly on Twitter with people. So uh, I tend not to dive into these other groups, but I have heard really wonderful things about LinkedIn groups and uh, them being easy to use. And just a, a, not that it's totally private, but a more private setting to be able to have conversations. So I'm really glad that Ed uh, wrote this email because I think there's a lot of people out there who depend on LinkedIn and maybe, you know, it's just not perfect for us, but it's great for others out there who, uh, you know, want an environment that is a a little more business-like in some ways and they can attack uh, conversations like that. Absolutely. Now, the next uh, the next feedback that we got um, is from someone that I believe you know, Amber. Yeah, I know. This is really funny. I just saw this in the rundown. Uh, so Philip Shane, I think I mentioned uh, how we met on Twitter uh, earlier. I guess it was in March earlier this year. And uh, he helped arrange for me to have an interview uh, with Kevin Clash, the puppeteer behind Elmo, as well as Elmo. And I got to interview Philip, too. So it looks like uh, Philip, I should mention, too, is the co-director uh, of Being Elmo. And uh, he's a really great guy. And and it uh, looks like he did a video for us. And I have no idea what the video is, Sarah. All I know is on Twitter, he said to both of us that he's afraid that his cat is going to think this video makes him or makes the cat look fat. Oh, so I don't listeners, think. I don't know. You won't be able to see that, but uh, I, we'll, we'll walk you through it. <laughs> I, I don't think poor Kitty has anything to worry about, but we'll let you guys um, judge for yourself. All right. Here's Philip's video question. Take it away. Oops. Hey, that didn't work. Hi guys, uh, Philip Shane here. You're not Spot fat. Is also here. Spot, you're lovely. We're both big fans of the show. I just had a quick question about Facebook. A um, couple quick questions. Number one, I have a small group of friends who refuses to join Facebook. Absolutely, you know, they say it's too complicated. They're worried about privacy, and I think it's too bad because I feel like. Um, uh, in a strange way, I'm not as close to them than I might be to some other friends on Facebook, some of whom I don't even know quite as well. And yet we've grown closer because of the daily contact and sharing of photographs and sharing of thoughts and, and all that that you do on Facebook. Um, cat, cat is itching your head. And my second question. Cat's like, this is so boring. Is, uh, 
how do I politely refuse friend requests? Oh. I mm. got a friend request from my mom. Oh, yes. <gasps> you have to There's some things you put on Facebook you just don't want your mom to see, you know? Um, well, maybe you, Philip. Theoretically, I could block her and do all that kind of crazy stuff. What are you but doing on Facebook? That just terrible, doesn't it? And uh, I don't want to go through all that complicated things. Uh, um, but I don't know what to say to her. And sometimes you're at parties and you meet people and then they send you a friend request and they might be fine people, but you don't, you just don't feel like having them as your friend on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and then you see them later and they say, hey, I sent you a friend request. So That's I'm just wondering if you have any <laughs> suggestions. Do you tell her uh. that lie? Do you tell the honest truth? Love to know what you guys think. Well, Philip, I think his his conundrum affects a lot of folks. I mean, his first question was, how do you kind of deal with friendships with people who, for mm. whatever reason, aren't on Facebook or don't want to use it or are turned off by it? And I have this problem with... It's not so much that I have a problem with friends not, in, not wanting to use Facebook because there are very few that I can think of anyway that don't. Um, and sometimes they have good reasons. But I do feel that sometimes I'm closer with people who are more avid Facebook users just because I get more updates from them. You know, I see more pictures of that barbecue that they went to. I, I feel like if we were to meet up in real life, I would have a pretty good idea of what they had been doing for the last year. Whereas other friends, if they're not that active, you feel a little bit more in the dark about what they're doing when they're not online. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really uh, a great point. And uh, I think of my friend, Jenna, who's my best friend. We've been friends since we were 11. And uh, she's not on Facebook. And it's kind of funny because she, you know, as much as she's my best friend, I'm not sure if she knows at day to day what goes on in my life, like my Twitter friends, some of whom I've never, ever met in person. So it's sort of an interesting situation. But the funny thing is, Jenna is constantly coming over to my house and asking for me to log into Facebook so she can creep and look at other people's pages. So um, there are people out there who uh, they don't want to be on it, but I think they still, you know, they, they want to be able to uh, lurk around now and again. And uh, I think that's kind of interesting. So I, I think we can go to the second question from Philip, because that is also a very interesting question. And uh, I'll answer the first one about your mom, about his mom, <laughs> and then maybe you can do the friend one. Yeah. And all I have to say is, Philip, I'm talking to you. Having had a child and uh, having a, a two-year-old right now and knowing that uh, it's a lot of work, you need to accept your mom's request right now and clean up your Facebook act because uh, it's your mom. Heck, and you know what? I don't know what you're doing out there, but uh, don't put it on Facebook anymore. Anyway, and uh, and say yes, mom. I will accept your request, and you should uh, encourage her to join Facebook. That's yeah. my <laughs> and that's and that's advice coming from someone's mother. So, Philip, exactly. friend your mom. I my mom is my friend on Facebook. Sometimes I get information about what she did via Facebook, and I'm glad. So that when I talk to her on the phone, I'm like, "How was that lunch you had with Aunt Susie?" Uh -huh. Because I know you did because you had a picture and it looked fun, you know, that sort of thing. I, yeah, I don't, I've never really understood people um, getting freaked out about family members also being on Facebook, but I guess family dynamics can be very complex. Um, as but far as friends who want to, uh, you know, who someone that you met at a dinner party, for example, that you maybe barely know, or you didn't really like that much. But you did meet them, so they can say that they know you IRL, who then you get a friend request from and you go, oh no, what do I do? Um, I have, I've had this problem before. Um, you can ignore it, which is the, the very passive uh, way to just not do anything. Um, but then they can still see a lot from your profile. That's sort of the weird thing that some people don't know about Facebook is when you say, you know, not now for a friend request, you really didn't say no. So it's like they get a little window into your Facebook life until you actually say no, which is yeah. a whole nother screen. Um, but you could also just, um, you could get um, really organized about it and create groups. Um, you can exactly. give certain groups, certain um, uh, windows into your activity. You can restrict others. Your mom or the friend that you met at the dinner party that you're kind of so-so on can go into group lists who only have um, access to maybe your work history and some of your likes, um, maybe just certain photo albums kind of a thing. You can get really specific with Facebook. And um, I think that that is everyone's best bet, especially mm -hmm. if you're friending people that you just don't, you just don't know that well. You don't know that much about their character and you don't want to regret them knowing too much about you later on. You might as well give them a little access at first. And then if you become best friends. And you can decide. Later yeah, on. exactly. All right. 
Well, hopefully we helped uh, Philip out a little bit and uh, he's accepting his mom right now. Uh, <laughs> great questions and emails uh, on this episode. And of course, uh, if you want to write us, you can email the social hour at twit.tv. Uh, you can also leave us a voicemail, right, Sarah? Yeah, 2626 social. That's our, uh, that's our Google voice number. Uh, it's local somewhere. I know it's not in the Bay Area, but uh, 2626 S O C I A L. Or, of course, uh, like Philip did, record a video. You know, put your cat in the video. Whatever you want to do. That's cool. Uh, we'd love to see your face. Try to keep it to 30 seconds or less whenever possible. I know it's that's hard to do, but um, it helps us um, put it into our rundown a little bit more easily. Just send us the link if you upload it somewhere, YouTube or Vimeo or anything else like that. Amber, before we get to our rad or fad segment, want to thank Netflix really quickly for being our third sponsor in the show. If you're not familiar with Netflix, what is going on with you? I actually suspect that pretty much everybody who watches our show knows about Netflix. You're either already a customer or for whatever reason, you know, you haven't gotten on the train yet. But I, I don't think we have to explain what Netflix does, but maybe... Maybe, um, you know, it's graduation season and maybe you are someone's sister or aunt or mom um, and you'd like to give them maybe a really cool graduation gift like a Netflix subscription for a year. I mean, talk. I would love that. I would have loved it if it was around, you know, when I graduated high school or college. And that way they can get, uh, once they have a Netflix account, instant streaming access via a variety of, of, of ways. Um, your PC or your Mac... Apple TV, Wii, Xbox 360, all sorts of ways to watch Netflix streaming. Or you can get DVDs uh, sent to your house, right into your mailbox. You can just walk out there in your pajamas, um, pick up uh, SpongeBob SquarePants. Great movie. <laughs> and then watch it and, uh, you know, have something to do for the summer. If you want to know even more about certain movies before you add them to your queue, which, of course, you manage online, just go to Netflix.com slash twit. That's actually our special URL, so they know that you came through us. And find out that SpongeBob Squares. SquarePants is, uh, let's see. Oh, this is actually a series. There's 229 episodes, in fact. 21 Sarah, discs. Where does SpongeBob SquarePants live? Um, well, I've never actually watched <laughs> the show. So I bet you would know, though. He lives in a pineapple <laughs> under the tree. Oh, that's cute. I just wanted to see if you knew where he lived. I, I, you know what? My son doesn't watch it, but for some reason I know that. Don't even ask. Well, they've been around. Don't I mean, even ask. SpongeBob is uh, SpongeBob has been is has been liked far and wide by adults. I mean, obviously very successful. Or maybe you're you're more of a um, uh, Jackie Chan type of a person, and you want to watch the new Karate Kid starring Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith, who of course That's is Will Smith's son. That is also available instant streaming. They have titles that are being added all the time, so their instant streaming catalog is really getting impressive. Um, and again, even more uh, discs available if you want to go the DVD route. Some Blu-ray uh, uh, available as well if you're into, you know, really super high quality. Anyway, Netflix.com slash twit. Get a month of free movies and free TV shows if you use that code. Netflix.com slash twit. Who doesn't want just a month to check out Netflix, see if it's the right thing for you? And again, it's a great gift. Even if you don't know oh, yeah. someone who graduated, maybe their birthday's coming up or something, that's a great gift. Hey, I'll just uh, buy you a year of movies. Go to town. So uh, we thank them very much for sponsoring us. And now... Time for yes. Rad or Fad. Amber, this rad is your pick. What is it? Our last uh, segment on the show, and uh, one of the most entertaining, of course, is Rad or Fad. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, this week's slot, uh, I have put in a link to a site called Past Posts. Uh, now, the idea of this is that uh, if you sign in with your Facebook account, mm -hmm. it will send you a daily email that will tell you exactly what you did or what you posted as your status update one year ago from the day. So uh, kind of an interesting way to keep track of how far you've progressed or fallen behind depending on what your status update says and uh, a fun way just to uh, you know bring those status updates uh, back from the past that's cool so I just signed in it was very easy I mean it's pulling from Facebook so I just use Facebook connect I said yes you can have access to my Facebook information and then I didn't even have to uh, uh, you know give them my email or anything like that because of course that is already within Facebook's settings as well so it's gonna go to my sarahlane.com email I assume and it said, thank you, you'll receive your first email tomorrow. Now, I think that people will either love this idea because there's sort of mm -hmm. that nostalgia or, wow, I, I forgot all about the fact that I did, <laughs> you know, these things that day or, you know, my friend got married that day kind of thing. But you have to really like the idea of getting a daily email. And that is mm -hmm. a very personal choice. I'm not necessarily 
needing any more emails in my inbox every day. What, what yeah. about you? Well, I just signed up. So I just signed up this morning and uh, I think I kind of need to see how it goes. So I will unsubscribe over a few days if I find it irritating. However, if I find it entertaining and it makes me feel good about, you know, either how far I've come or things that I've accomplished or, oh, wow, you know, last year I was doing this and isn't it kind of need to reflect on that, then I'll probably stick with it. So I'm going to try it uh, like many of the great web tools we talk about. It's totally free. So um, there is no harm in giving it a whirl for a bit. So We'll see what happens. And Sarah, you've added one here too. Do you want to talk about it now or next week? Or Yeah, well, you know, I just added it as just a little addendum because um, a friend of mine put together a very simple service that, that reminds me, actually, um, mm -hmm. that they're similar. It's called Morning Picks. Um, this okay. is actually um, a way to connect to Instagram. And it's, it's a very similar concept where one uh, every morning, one picture from your past, and I think it's random, um, will be sent to you via email. So the idea is is that if you're obviously a, a, a voracious uh, Instagram user and you take a lot of pictures, you don't necessarily remember what picture you took uh, 60 days ago kind of a thing. And so it emails you the picture and then it, and it adds also everyone who had liked or commented on it. So, you know, it might give you a little boost like, oh, yeah, that was a good picture. And That's look, fun. all these people liked it. And and again, I, I'm still trying to get past the whole ooh, another daily email. You know, I subscribe to so many newsletters. And then there's mm -hmm. also all the unwanted emails and PR emails and just things that it's it's a bit of a chore for me to get through. So even if this felt good, I don't know that the volume is working for me, but I do like the idea. I think I think for the for the right people, mm -hmm. this is very rad. I like what they say on Morning Picks, though, about that uh, email issue you mentioned. They say email that's fun to get. Email sucks because it requires you to do stuff. My Morning Picks requires nothing and always makes me smile. Because that, that's a nice point. You know, you just look at it, and you delete it. I can handle those type of emails. Yeah, exactly. Which kind of falls in the category of PR emails. Many of them I look at and delete as well. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> All the time, even in blocks. It's like one through ten. Yep. Dum. Especially when they don't even say my name and they just say, hello. Yes. And then they go on. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes it's the wrong name or sometimes it's dear comma. <laughs> and you yeah. go, oh, you didn't finish. Oh, did you do that? This is <laughs> this was sent to somebody else too, wasn't it? I'm not that yeah. special. That reminds me, sorry, I know we have to wrap and we've been way over, but um, I was watching, I didn't realize, I, I totally love Jimmy Fallon and I didn't realize that he does so many Twitter segments on his show and, uh, you know, he'll have a hashtag that, uh, um, you know, people can use on the, and he'll actually read out the tweets the next night. So uh, one of his hashtags recently was, uh, um, uh, I, yes, I went there or something like that, but it was, it, it's just a, it was so funny. It reminds me of this, like with the PR people, like, yes, you did that sort of thing. Yeah. So maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm, I know it's, it's, it's email. It's a, another complex issue. Um, it is. another, another show, Sarah, another show for another time, but that's it for us on episode 10 again, double digits. Woohoo. Um, again, recorded live on, uh, at a, at an unusual time for us to accommodate for, um, us having a nice long weekend, one of us anyway, the, U <laughs> the U.S. Uh, portion of, of our hosting. Um, I don't know what I'm going to be doing on Monday. Hopefully somebody will have a barbecue or at least the weather will be nice and just kind of mm. just kind of relax. Um, relax. But uh, the following week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled live recording time, which is again, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Please join us. We're going to have uh, the CEO of Oyster.com on the show as a guest. And if you're not familiar with them, it is going to change your life if you like to travel and you like to know a little bit more about where you're going ahead of time. Uh, so that's a little peek into what we're going to be talking about on the next episode. But for now, that's it. Amber, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, enjoy your weekend. You too. And we'll see you next time on The Social Hour. Bye-bye.